Tonight on Rescue 911, these true stories of extreme adversity and overwhelming love. Can you tell for sure if it's the baby's head? I would not want to have heard somebody say, uh-oh, when they were standing at the other end of me delivering the baby. I don't want you to say, uh-oh, again, but what did you say, uh-oh, for? Usually I'd say, now look both ways before you cross the road, but for some reason or other, I just didn't say it that time. He has no pulse. You're totally, absolutely helpless. The plane is just so, it got smaller and smaller and smaller. You just didn't know, there was nowhere to go. Man, you're stuck. In an emergency out of reach of professional rescue workers, any one of us might be asked to perform the impossible under the most unforgiving conditions. We begin on January 26, 1994, as Frank Hartnett was escorting his 73-year-old mother, Sally, on a flight from Connecticut to her winter home in Florida. We were walking down the concourse, and we had to keep stopping so she could catch her breath. So it's just very unusual for her. Never saw her do that before. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, we'd like to begin boarding Delta Flight 534, nonstop service to Tampa. When they called for boarding, she didn't look any different than any other time. Hi. I love my mother very much. Whatever she wants or whatever she needs, thank you, thank you she can have much. it. Hi there, how are you? Are you ready to get away from the cold weather up here? Home. Good. How best for I had no feeling whatsoever that anything would go wrong. said, can I get a drink of water? Excuse me, ma'am. Can yes, I have sir. some water? You sure may. She's feeling kind of warm. She said, I've just taken nitro. I need oxygen. There you go, sir. And as I handed her the cup, she dropped it. And she said, I need oxygen. And that was the last thing she said. Sir, is everything OK? Jeanette okay? McClarty was one of the flight attendants. He told me that she had taken a nitro pill, which immediately alerted me to the fact that she obviously had some heart problem. Okay, I'll call the crew, and I'll be right back to check on her. It just seemed impossible that she could have another heart attack. A year after having a quadruple bypass, you're 30,000 feet up in the air, and in your mind, you're trying to think, what the heck are we going to do now? Senior flight attendant Judy Wilde took charge of the situation. Are you feeling better? Are you cool? When I first heard that we had an ill passenger in the back and that we were starting oxygen... Judy, um, this is her son. He's I didn't think too much about it. This really occurs more than you would imagine. Would you get some cool cloths for me? Ma'am, are oh. you feeling any better? But when I got in front of her and shook her by the shoulders and said, Can you hear me? I got no response. Can you hear me? And I thought, uh-oh, she's in trouble. I immediately started trying to find a pulse. I did not now, find can you one. Hear me? Page for Dr. Jeanette. I knew if I didn't have someone to help me, that the other flight attendants and I would have to, to do the best that we could do. When we continue, she has no pulse. you're totally, absolutely helpless. The plane is just so, it got smaller and smaller and smaller. You just didn't know, there was nowhere to go. Man, you're stuck. When Frank Hartnett's 73-year-old mother, Sally, suffered a cardiac arrest during a flight to Florida, the only hope for her survival was in the hands of the people who happened to be on board. May I have your attention, please? If there is a doctor, nurse, or paramedic on board, will you please contact your flight attendant? Thank you. This guy came out of nowhere. I'm a doctor. And if he didn't come from heaven, nobody did. I'm getting no response here. I can't find a pulse. Excuse me. Dr. Tom Candell, an internist, happened to be on the flight. 
She was pale and clammy. She was not breathing on her own, and she had no pulse. This passenger was clinically dead. We told the captain that he had to land the airplane. But the plane was 30 minutes from the nearest airport. I was very frightened to see him start CPR on her. I was very afraid she was going to die. My father had died about two years ago, and I kept thinking, I really don't want to go through this again. It's too soon. He said, I'm afraid I'm going to break her bones because she is older and very fragile. So I said to him, the alternative is unacceptable. If you have to break the bones, break the bones. And he started working harder. Three and four and five. Breathe. One and two and three and At four the end, about ten minutes, for the first time, I thought I had a pulse. Just a little pulse. Have you got a uh, stethoscope or blood pressure cuff or anything? I do. I'll Unfortunately, get it. after that first attempt, we lost the pulse and we had to resume the CPR. He knew that her chances were not as good after we had lost her after the first comeback. And I remember whispering into Judy Wilde's ear, I think we're going to lose her. I don't think she's going to make it. One and two and three and four. The crew called Carol and said, can we make it to Atlanta? And I said, no. We knew that we were doing all that we possibly could do with the limited supplies that we had on board. It was very important for us to land as quickly as possible. New York Center, Delta 584. We are declaring a medical emergency at this time. We'd like to divert to Philadelphia. It had been nearly 20 minutes since Sally's cardiac arrest. I'm getting a slight pulse. We got a second pulse, and I listened closely. Sure enough, there was a heartbeat going on, but she was not breathing on her own. She's arrhythmic, but I think we're losing her again. Let's it was to frustrating to see that she wasn't responding. Even in the best of hands, CPR could only give between 20 to 30 percent of the actual cardiac output. Even more frustrating was realizing that the man that was standing over my shoulder and looking down was the son of this passenger, and he was witnessing the demise of his own mother. One and two and three. You're totally, absolutely helpless. The plane is just so, it got smaller and smaller and smaller. You just didn't know, there was nowhere to go. Man, you're stuck. You're right there. One and two and three and four and five. We kept working on the patient probably another five to ten minutes. And as we were coming in to Philadelphia, the patient all of a sudden, for the first spontaneous time, took a deep breath on her own. Two and three. She moaning? I'm hearing her. We're getting her back. I thought she's going to make it if we can just get on the ground and let the paramedics do what they can do for her. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be making an unscheduled emergency landing, so we may take care of the passenger that has become ill. Once we landed, the paramedics came on board quickly. And as he was sticking in the angiocath to start the IV, Sally grunted, and I said, do you feel that, Sally? Do you feel the pain? And Sally shook her head. And I said, Sally, you're feeling the pain because you're alive. Four months have passed since the incident. I can feel my strength returning day by day, but a very slow process. They determined that my mother has an extreme allergic reaction to nitro. So when she put the pill in her mouth in the plane, it bottomed her blood pressure out so far that it killed her. It was the first time that I had ever taken nitroglycerin. I threw the pills out. I'll never take another one. So what happens, happens. It would be foolish for one to say, don't take nitroglycerin because it might have a side effect. But when people take any drug, whether it be nitroglycerin or aspirins or any combination of drugs, people should be cautious. Recently, Sally Hartnett finally got the chance to meet Dr. Kandel. <laughs> 
Good to see you. Oh, thank God for you. <laughs> I thank God every day for Dr. Kundell. Oh, it's great. How are you, my you're, talk, wife? you're talking to me. That's, <laughs> that's better than <laughs> how far. That's an improvement. Life is very fragile, and it's precious, and you guard it as best you can. And when you can't take care of yourself any longer and somebody comes to assist you, that's something that you'll never forget. He was my garden angel, I'll tell you that. Thank you so much for oh. saving. God bless you. Thank you. There is no way to describe how grateful you can be to somebody who saved your mother. I am ecstatic that she's okay. But I won't take her on any more trips anywhere. And I said to the doctor, you are the new travel agent because I am not going to take her anywhere. I've had enough. Get your hands off right there. I'm very thankful that Delta has a training program for a stewardess to teach them CPR. I learned how to serve a Coke after I started flying. But I learned how to do first aid in training before I ever got on an airplane. All right, let's go. I want Sally to know that being a factor in bringing her back was a very gratifying feeling. Cheers. Not for me as a physician, but for me as a fellow human being. And I'm glad that she's there and she's able to give love to her family and receive love from her family. Usually I'd say, now look both ways before you cross the road, but for some reason or other, I just didn't say it that time. On the afternoon of August 10th, 1994, 20-year-old Erica Young was looking after her youngest brother and sister at their home in Biglerville, Pennsylvania, as she had many times before. Being the oldest one at home, she soon found herself trying to do the best she could during one of her family's darkest moments. Okay, well, you guys stay close to the house, all right? Okay. There's eight kids in our family, and there's five girls. Luckily, it outweighs the boys, which are three. It's not your average American family by any means, but we get along pretty well. Erica was taking care of the youngest children, seven-year-old Danny and five-year-old Sherry. Sherry's a nice sister. I like that she plays with me. Sherry saw Teddy get the dog run across the road over into our neighbors. No, Teddy! She knew that Teddy wasn't supposed to be over there, and she went after him. Maida Switak lived right across the road. Teddy comes over quite frequently. Hi, Sherry. You taking Teddy home? Yep. Yeah. Occasionally, Sherry would come over for him. And usually I'd say, now look both ways before you cross the road. But for some reason or other, I just didn't say at that time. I saw cars and told Sherry, there's two cars coming. She thought I only said one. I heard this voice yelling, my God, call an ambulance. And I thought, oh, my gosh, something's happened to Sherry. In the area of 830 on road, a pedestrian struck cross street of Fairview Fruit Road and Forest Church Road, 17 I saw Sherry probably about 50 feet from where the car was. Sherry? Sherry? She was just laying there staring straight up and gurgling, and I knew that she was Sherry, choking on blood. Sherry, look at me. I just wanted to hold that little life and just keep it as long as possible. I was afraid to move her because I wasn't sure if her neck or anything was broken, but she went rigid and quit breathing. I had a horror that she was going to die in my arms. Sherry! Sherry! I eased my hand behind her neck and just turned her head just a little and cleared her mouth out so she could Sherry, breathe. Come on, come on, keep breathing. Keep breathing, Sherry. Sherry she started crying, and Sherry. I was just like, oh, thank heavens, you're breathing. Just stay with me. 
That's it. I know it hurts. Just keep on breathing. That's it. Within six minutes, the first volunteers arrived, including Cashtown Fire Chief Tom Norman. My assistant chief got there right ahead of me, and he said she looks pretty bad. So uh, I told him to go ahead and start the procedure for the helicopter. Can you help me out? I want yes. you to do one thing. Okay. Hold her head perfectly okay. still and keep talking to her for me, okay? okay? Her golden hour was ticking very fast. We had no idea if her back was broke or her neck could have been broke. Okay, Donnie, we want to rebreather her one on 15. She was breathing, but as scared to death, she was going to take one last breath, and that would be it. We want to get a collar on before we do anything. To the moment, we need a blanket also. We have a lot of nasty calls, but for a young child, this is one of the worst ones we've had. It just makes you feel like it's your own child when you're working on, you know, a girl that's hurt this bad. Gettysburg Hospital Advanced Life Support got to the scene soon after, including paramedic Herschel Shank. Chief, what happened? What do you got? Uh, okay. Looking at her face, blood coming from her nose and her mouth, there's signs of the possibility of a close head injury. Sherry, has she been talking to you? No. She wasn't very tall, so she struck the car uh, just in that area of the headlight, and she was thrown from my estimation about 40 feet. Sherry, there's going to be a bright light here in your eyes. That's it. There we go. It was obvious that she was critical. From where we were at that day, uh, transport time uh, via ground would probably almost take uh, up to an hour. So it was appropriate to have her flown via helicopter. Donna Young came home from work as soon as she was notified. Erica was crying. Danny. He had seen it happen. And he was just crying. He wouldn't talk. I think it's more vital signs here. Do I, have I went into the ambulance and she was crying. Mom? Yes. I got in front of her and I said, Sherry, it's mommy. Sherry. That's it. Can you hear me, Sherry? She did not respond. She just didn't even know I was there. I had to stay waiting for dad to get home. Oh, that was bad. When Dad came through the driveway and he had to tell him Sherry was hit. My first remark was on how bad. And uh, she said at that time that they medevaced her to Hershey Medical Center. I worked as a helicopter mechanic for police and medevac operations. So I knew it would be very serious because I know they don't medevac people for anything less than a severe trauma. Five-year-old Sherry Young was taken to Hershey Medical Center, where a team of doctors took over her care, including pediatric surgeon Robert Silly. We're going to need to get plastic surgery call, take a look at her face, and let neurosurgery know that we're going to have be getting a head scan on her, okay? She had her forearm bones broken in two different places each, multiple broken bones of the face, too many to count, quite frankly, and I thought she was likely to have a significant brain injury, the kind that you may not recover from. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though the earth be removed and though... My wife and our pastor was there with my older daughter, and at that time there was no information. Uh, everything was a wait and see. You can see that the mid-face is shattered on both sides, so we got a lot of work to do. Plastic surgeon Stephen Kaler was in charge of the delicate operation to reconstruct Sherry's face. From the x-rays, it was clear that she'd broken every bone in her face. This is certainly, without a doubt, the worst facial fracture in a child that I've ever seen. In order to treat these facial bone injuries, it's necessary to make an incision over the top of the head and actually peel the scalp down so we can wire those bone fragments together. We sat and we tried to just talk and pass the time and sift through our feelings. This type of surgery it takes a long time. We got started about midnight or so. And um, we operated all night and into the next day and finished up about noon. After she came out of the operation, they told us it would be like 24, 48 hours to see how she would heal. And the only thing we could do at that point was pray that uh, things were working out. 
two days passed with very little change. Jeff come in and he talked to her and he called her Snort. That's her nickname. And uh, she heard us and knew that we were there. And she went like this. And uh, I started to laugh. And then I started to cry. Be all right. I knew then that Sherry was getting better. After the first couple days, she just kept getting better and better and better. It was miraculous in recovery. When Sherry was injured, the majority of the energy that her head absorbed was in her face. And it hurt her face terribly, but her face was fixable. Fortunately, her brain was not so seriously injured, and she's had a wonderful recovery. Three months have passed since Sherry was hit by the car. Now, before we even step onto the road, I say, what are you going to do? And she goes, look both ways. And then I say, what else do you do? And I told him to listen, not only to look, but to listen for cars. It makes you realize what a wonderful thing a family is when something like this happens because you have each other to lean upon. The car hit Sherry and I was real scared. I love my whole family. I love Sherry too. It was an accident, but the helicopter came down. They sent doctors and nurses in there. I'm gonna ride in it again. If I've learned anything, people can arise to a need and fulfill it. If it wasn't for Erica being able to uh, have the courage to do what she did, uh, the doctors or nobody else probably would have made any difference. You're doing good. Sherry is a very dramatic little five-year-old. She's very animated. She's very active. She's very wild. Her accident hasn't slowed her down one bit. It's been great to see her back to her normal self. It's, it's really great. Next. It's a natural curiosity. Everybody likes to play in water. But it's too dangerous. On July 12, 1994, a violent rainstorm passed through Eunice, Louisiana. Although the rains brought some obvious problems, Colleen Gustin assumed, having lived in the area most of her life, that when the skies cleared, it would be safe for her son and his friend to go out and play. It was really some of the worst rain that we've seen here in years. If the water was three, four feet, on the highway in front of our house. It was something. The boys were pretty much confined to indoors all day. The afternoon when the rain did stop, they asked to go outside and play. I thought it was safe because the water really had receded some. And don't be too long. Cool, look up. 11-year-old Thomas Lemoyne had come over to the house of his best friend, Adam Gustin. Thomas. He's fun to play with, and he's funny, and he's my friend. We put our boots on, and then we went outside, and we just we were talking, and we didn't really look at where we were going. We seen this ditch that was full of water. I jumped in it, and then it went a little over my my nose. Probably over my head. We uh, found a pipe to the other side of the ditch. And we went and walked across the pipe. It was moving fast. Wait, 
Eunice police officer John Cormier was on routine patrol in the area. I was watching the water, you know, waiting for it to recede so I can pull up my barricades on the highway. I saw two young boys playing in the water. It's a natural curiosity. Everybody likes to play in water, but it's too dangerous. All right, Barbara, you need to get out of the water and go home before somebody gets hurt. I don't want to catch you all in here again. The policeman told us to get away from the ditch, and we walked away. They got 15, 20 yards from me, and I went on westbound. I decided I needed a cup of coffee. I said, wait for me. Um, I'll cross the five one more time. Help! I thought he was faking at first. Help! All you could see was his head. I just grabbed him before he went in the fight. Help! 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 He was going under. Help! I felt that I didn't want to let him go. Help! So I just screamed, help. Johnny McGee happened to be going by on his way home. When I passed, I seen a little kid caught my eye. And when I turned back and just glimpsed at him, all I seen was a head sticking up out the water. Mark Edwards was running an errand across the street. Hear a kid screaming for help. The guy that was standing up on the ground was screaming, please, somebody come help my friend drowning. I started trying to pull him out, and it's like he wasn't even budging. It's like something had him down there and wasn't going to turn him loose. Off-duty police officer Ronald Papillon also happened to be across the street. His face was just so white, and he just kept hollering, kept hollering, help me, help me, please don't let me die, please don't let me die. I said, this ain't working, that pulling ain't working. I said, something's wrong, this guy's stuck, and he's not coming out. Somebody was down there pulling his legs in. I'm trying to pull him out. Huh? The current was strong. The way it had him, he couldn't move. I was scared myself. I definitely didn't want him to drown with that arm reach of me. If we made a mistake and slipped up, he was gone. The suction and the current would have took him through the pipes. You looking at uh, almost a mile underneath through the pipe. Try and pull his leg. All right, good. I got him. If he would have went down the pipe before he got to that big canal, he would have been dead. I was real scared. Calm down. Calm down. We got you. But it seemed like the water was rising because he kept pushing his head over the water. So, you know, the water wouldn't get in his nose. The little fellow was, he was determined he was going to hang on, you know, he wasn't going down, and I was determined I was going to get him out. And finally, it's like it was just broke suction. I didn't realize how bad the suction was till after we got him out. When we pulled him out, it's like we unclogged the drain. But look, Johnny's stopping it back up, you know, it stuck me up to it. Oh, no way. After more than 15 minutes of fighting to keep his head above water, Thomas was safely out of the pipe. His mother, Rachel Lemoyne, rushed to the scene as soon as she heard what had happened. I expected the worst. I ran to the ambulance and saw him sitting there and, uh, you know, wet and dirty with a little oxygen mask, and I was just 
so relieved, so relieved. Adam's mother, Colleen, had also been notified. Thomas looked bad. My heart went to my feet. But everybody reassured me, you know, that it was okay, that they were, you know, very, very lucky that uh, it ended up with, you know, Thomas not getting sucked down the drainage pipe. If he'd have lied back and he wouldn't have held on, he was gone. I was, I was shaking like a tremble, but it wasn't a cold. I didn't even feel a wet. I just felt like I was nervous for what I'd done. Six months later, Thomas still remembers the day vividly. I was saying, please help me, please help me to get out. And then he pulled me out, and I said, thank you very much, I love you. Thomas could have lost his life, and I really don't know if that's something that Adam or myself could have lived with. They knew that, you know, they had done wrong. Number one, leaving the yard where they would have been safe. And number two, not listening to the police officer. One of the things I like about Thomas and Adam's friendship is Adam's kind of clear-headed. I think other kids might have panicked. They might have left to go get help. But Adam had the presence of mind to stay there and help. And I'll always be grateful to him for that. Adam is my hero. I guess I can call myself a hero because I, I didn't let go of him until help came. But I'm not the only hero. The gentleman that pulled, pulled Thomas out, they didn't stop to think, well, can we do this? You know, what might happen to us? They just jumped in. I think they're just terrific. I don't feel like I've ever thanked them appropriately or, or can. We're going to feed him. We're going to fatten him up. I'm just doing what anybody else would have done. Hopefully, anybody else would have done. It feels like it never happened. I feel good. I just I play around in the neighborhood now. I don't ride in the ditches no more. This is might be fun to play in, but they could be dangerous. So you need to stay away from them. It's maybe a little bit smarter because dangerous things can happen when you never expect it. I think Thomas will always be my friend. Next. Can you tell for sure if it's the uh -oh. baby's head? I would not want to have heard somebody say, uh-oh, when they were standing at the other end of me delivering the baby. I don't want you to say, uh-oh, again, but what did you say, uh-oh, for? Chris and Tom Guyton of Foothill Ranch, California, had taken childbirth classes and were looking forward to delivering their second baby naturally. But nothing they learned could prepare them for the unusual predicament they found themselves in on July 22nd, 1994. At 2.15 in the morning, I heard my wife walking around the house. The baby was due the next day. Are you all right? It was time to start timing the contractions. Yeah. Okay, we need to time this, all right? I was concerned because the contractions were a little bit quicker than I would like them to be when I was at home because I still knew we had a 20-minute drive to go to the hospital. I called the doctor. The doctor says, you need to get her down here right now. I'll be right there. Just about there. And all of a sudden, her water broke. Okay, please. Okay. I could see that the baby was going to be coming very quickly. Okay. And I knew we weren't going to make it to the hospital. Okay. Chris's mother, Rosina Pallada, was staying with them to help after the birth. I didn't know how fast this child was going to come. All right. I thought we were in trouble. Right. Then I thought, what in God's name are we going to do here, the two of us? Uh, hello, my daughter is expecting a baby, and something's going wrong. Could you send somebody right away? Sure. How far along is your daughter? Uh, they expect it on the 23rd. All right. It's coming now. Yeah, okay. Well, we can take care of that. Tell them they're on the way. 
I saw something coming out, but it looked like a lot of skin. It didn't look like it would be the top of his head, but I wasn't willing to give up on the head because it's supposed to be the head that comes out first. We are talking crowning of some sort, but I can't tell whether it's a head. It doesn't look like the it head. It doesn't look like a head? No, does it, it does look not. Does it look like skin or does it look like hair? It looks like skin. Does not. I don't see any hair whatsoever, and there is this big bulbous thing that has come out. It feels like it's kind of connected to her. Orange County Fire Dispatcher Valerie Williamson was handling the call. I kind of wondered how he couldn't know what it was, but I was hoping it was going to be the head. I have a lot of instructions for head. I don't have much if it's not for a head. So I'm still hoping. In fact, in my mind, I'm thinking, please, God, let it be a head. And you can't tell what it is, whether well, it's Well, a... I'm not really good at it. It could no, be a head. It could... Okay. It could be a head. It could be. I'm not, you know, okay, I'm... what you need to do is place one hand over the baby's head. Okay. And apply very gentle, really gentle. You don't want to hurt the head. Pressure to keep the baby from popping out too fast. Should yeah. I have her pushing? She pretty much can push when she feels like it's ready to push. Don't okay, tell her to stop or anything. Okay, you feel like it, Chris. Okay, Chris, here you go. I want you to push. One, two, three, four, five. Push, push. Sure if it's the uh -oh. baby's head. Dan Oliver has said, and I hear him say, uh-oh. Okay. I would not want to have heard somebody say, uh-oh, when they were standing at the other end of me delivering a baby. Uh-oh would not have been the word I wanted to hear. I was just thinking how scared she must be. I don't want you to say, uh-oh, again, but what did you say, uh-oh, for? I have got a feeling that he is coming out ass first. And then I was really concerned. I just really didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea how I was going to deliver a baby rear end first. I'm not okay. sure, though. I could be wrong, but it feels, it looks like his little balls are coming out. Okay, it... hold on a second. I mean, just do what you're doing. Okay. I was alarmed. Dispatchers aren't medical experts. I didn't have the answers to give him, and the closest available help, and the best, was the paramedics who were on the way. Paramedic Bill Lockhart and his partner were still only halfway to the house. Medic 38, if it's not the head that's coming out first, if it's the other end, do I tell them to push or not push? It's best not to have them push. Put her on her left side, and uh, we'll be there shortly. It's best to have her on her left side. Medic 38, 10-4, we'll have her lay on her left side and not push. In the hospital, they'd immediately go to a cesarean section because breaches have about a four to five times greater risk of fetal demise. Orange County Fire, Medic 38, if it's a single foot, um, that's considered non-deliverable. Don't have her push. Don't have her Don't push. Don't have her push anymore. What have her I... lay on her left side. On your left side, Chris, I need you to roll over on your left Medic side. I'm an airline pilot. We get a lot of training on how to handle different emergencies that could come up, but I was pretty much flying blind. If they don't get here, I'm probably going to have to do something, and I had no idea what to do at that time. I felt there was danger at that point. She kept saying, my insides are coming out. Then I thought, something might happen, I might lose her. And the baby. The important thing for them to do is make sure that the cord is not being compressed. So uh, they should try to push the buttocks off of the cord if they can see the cord. In my heart, I was thinking, I wish the paramedics were already there. I was thinking, please, somebody get there, somebody that knows more than I do. You've got to make sure that the buttocks is off the cord. We've got to find out where that cord is. Right, I know what you mean. 8, 10, I can't tell if there's any cord right now. Okay, if I, you could feel with your fingers at gonna, all. I'm trying to do that right now. I, you're doing... Here comes a paramedic, Chris. Here Great. Are they in the room? Uh, they are just about in the room right now. Terrific. Well, congratulations, and I'll let you go. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. Well, we have a full term. Bill's partner was paramedic Paul Guns. When we walked in, you saw the baby's rear end. I mean, as clear as can be. If we were unable to deliver within about 10 minutes with transport, but the likely outcome would have been very bleak. We had to deliver it here. 
Right, we gave the family a little bit of reassurance, but we're always honest with them, and we don't want to give anybody false hope. Get the legs out. But unfortunately, when I felt within, I felt that the legs were crossed, which means more maneuvers would have to be done. Okay. A big breath, okay? I'm going to need that IV. Baby. Bill had a concerned look on his face. He didn't have to say anything. I knew what he was getting at. Okay, so we're going to be pushing back up inside a little bit more and just seeing if we can straighten out those legs. Had to reach inside and uncross the legs. And I was able to get the buttocks out and then hook the legs and get the legs out next. You might want to have to get the airway back. Yeah. The next step is to clear the shoulders. Okay, coming along. Got meconium. That's when the clock even starts ticking faster because the umbilical cord is now definitely compressed between the baby and the pelvic structure. Hang in there. I knew that I had at that point no more than four minutes to, to get the baby out. Just a little bit. We're coming along okay. Just, All right. Just hanging up a little bit, but we should be able to get him out. Yeah, that's okay. good. Okay. And, uh, good. Time was counting down, and the baby was still in there. Okay, we got the shoulders. I wasn't sure whether he was alive at this time. It'll be long now. I was hopeful that the head would just pop free. Unfortunately, the head hung up on the pelvic structure. Try to, try to take a deep breath. And the baby's very ashen and gray. Right. So you might want to you know, get the uh, ready for resuscitate. We had very little time to, to clear the head. The color of the baby was real poor, like there was an oxygen problem. And it was enough to really send a shiver up my spine. Okay. Your arm nice and still. Okay, I got the head out. We were able to get him out, but there was absolutely no movement whatsoever. He was just lifeless. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Start drying. I saw the baby coming out, and I didn't hear anything, and then I thought, oh, dear Lord, what is wrong? Okay. Is he okay? Uh, we got ten fingers and ten toes. Chris asked several times, is he okay, is he okay? And nobody said anything. Is he okay? And I wanted to see some sign the baby was alive. Get some O2 ready for him. The parents uh, are distressed that the, the, the baby's well. not doing well. Our anxiety level's up even higher at this point. We're just drying him off and stimulating him right now. The and finally, the baby took its first breath. Okay. Here we go. All right. Look at the healthy baby. Here you go, Mom. Things were looking fantastic. Oh, healthy baby boy. You could just feel the energy in the room and, uh, and the, uh, one communal sigh. Oh, Way know. to go. The baby started to pink up very quickly. I mean, right before our eyes. And that was like, you know, a blessing from above. That was really a nice moment. <laughs> oh, big yawn. Uh, oh, yeah. I was very happy. And they gave him to me, and everybody was fine. There you go. After he was born, oh, bliss, <laughs> happiness, relief. Yeah, yeah. It was just so touching to see him. And he was so good. He was just perfect. <laughs> Way to go, Tim. Way to go, Chris. And the paramedics, they have a radio that they carry with them, and they keyed up, and I could hear him cry. really neat. Give him a big kiss. Oh, yeah. Seven pound, 11 ounce baby Mark was examined at the hospital and found to have suffered no ill effects from his unusual entry into the world. It was such a great experience to witness the birth of my grandson, especially at my age. I mean, you know, not always having the opportunity to, to live to see this. Ah, how you doing? Yeah. He's just a joy to be around. I love him. Uh, he's a great little kid. He's my son. Let's go. Giving birth is like no other experience you can possibly have. And when you see that child and everything's fine and the Ready? baby's perfect, it's just an indescribable feeling. <laughs> and the fact that Bill, the paramedic, was there to help me get through that is just incredible. He was just a wonderful guy. I really feel like I owe my life to him. A little more hair than I do. <laughs> it's one of the most fulfilling and satisfying things that we do in our in our work. It was absolutely incredible, and the family was just absolutely magnificent. It all came together right there. It was an added uh, extra special moment for me because uh, three hours prior to us getting the call, it had become my birthday. Mark's got the same birthday as I do. It was a nice way to start my birthday. It was a great way to start my birthday.
Valerie. Valerie. The voice of the night. <laughs> I was really grateful to get this call. We do the best we can, but I've been on the phone trying to save someone, and it hasn't been successful. Oh, he's beautiful. Pretty much on a scale of good calls. This one was off the chart. Well, you helped a lot. You were, you were great. Bottom line, only God decides who lives and dies. But I really, really like the good calls. Incredible. Yeah, That's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> In many communities, emergency dispatchers are not trained to give first aid instructions over the phone or even legally allowed to do so. With support from you, this situation can be changed. This series is dedicated to all the men, women, and children who aid and comfort us during times of need. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next time for more true stories on Rescue 911. Step out of the car, please.